Mr. Holmes World History class. Today we're looking at standard two. Uh, identify the major achievements of Chinese and Indian societies to 500 CE or AD. We're looking at element C. Explain the development and impact of Hinduism on India. Now looking at these two images right here, this is the pantheon of Hindu gods. Uh, if you look over to the right, this is one of the main gods, Brahma. Uh, and this shows the origins of the caste system. Now, Hinduism's origins. Hinduism's origins is going to really start in the Indo-European tradition, uh, which is going to be preserved through the Vedas. So the Vedas were a, a key text, as you can see these two pages up here. Um, and you're going to have Indo-European Aryans blend this um, kind of tradition here with other traditions of the Dravidian population, which is southern India, Indo-European, Aryans are from uh, more along the lines of kind of Central Asia. Um, now, what you can see here is that they are going to create really an early form of Hinduism in this period. The religious traditions are going to begin to formalize 750 BC to 550 BC, and this is going to be due to the writings called the Upanishads. So you can see two pages from the Upanishads here, and um, the Veda, the Vedas are up here. Now our faith is going to center on the basic belief that all living things are reincarnated after death with the quality of the next life based on the deeds or karma of the individual in the previous life. So you probably heard people say karma is a boop. Problem with that is that just addresses bad behavior, right? Uh, people get back what they put out into the world. Here, this basically says that the quality of your next life, not just this one you live in now, is going to really be based on the deeds of your previous life or lives. Now, the best way to really think about this is that humans are expected to live according to dharma. And dharma, as you can see here, just means duty, your daily duties. And it's basically the principle of cosmic order. Essentially, you are given a job based on your, and we'll look at it, ethnicity as well as um, predominantly where you're from. Okay. Now, good conduct will be rewarded with an eventual release from the cycle of reincarnation, and that is called moksha. So moksha is freedom from life and death. You are no longer going to be reincarnated carnated, um, as a person or a living thing, um, and you will break the release and essentially just exist um, spirit-wise in the universe. Now, the caste system. So, really, our, our Dravidian and Aryan um, you know, combinations here are going to really combine, again, with the dominance of the Indo-European Aryans over the indigenous Dravidians. And this is going to lead to the creation of a very rigid social class system that we call the caste, or uh, in uh, Sanskrit, Varna. Now... There is a level of racism here, absolutely. The Indo-European Aryans were uh, lighter skinned here, uh, again, from Central Asia, whereas our um, Dravidian population is darker skinned from the, you know, uh, very far south in the subcontinent. So our population is going to be divided into five hereditary social classes. And again, those are based on ethnicity and occupation. So... Typically, your North Indian men are going to be from here on up. Uh, your Southern Indian men are uh, going to be Sudra, um, which is commoners, peasant servants, or and or untouchables, where they are completely outside the caste system. Their job is to clean toilets, streets, um, whereas North Indian men could be... There are probably some that maybe are Sudra, typically not untouchables, they could be as high as Brahmin, priests, academics, teachers, things like that. Um, now, interestingly enough, if you look here, with knowledge of what the caste system is now, you can see that the chief god Brahma is broken down into various appendages. The head representing the priest class, the 
Kshatriya is the warrior kings. They're the arm. Is That would make sense because they're the strong, right? Uh, portion of society. The Vashyas, the farmers, traders, merchants, they're going to be working with their legs, um, doing the hard work. And then the hardest work, the laborers are the feet. Um, and then again, our uh, untouchables are outside the cast. Now, moving forward, Hinduism is going to fully develop uh, during the Gupta dynasty, so 320 to 520 CE. And during this period, we're going to see the hereditary nature of the occupational classes of the caste system, patriarchy, the belief in the pantheon of gods, the rich tradition of epic literature like the Vedas, the Upanishads, um, they are going to become very commonplace as well as the construction of monumental Hindu architecture. So for instance, the stupa you see here. So our traditions are going to be established in the Gupta dynasty or the Gupta empire, uh, and they will endure for centuries among the population of South Asia. Hinduism's dominance, however, is going to be challenged by the emergence of new faiths, for instance, Jainism, which is kind of like a early precedent to, to Buddhism, and then also Buddhism around 500 BCE. So this is just an image of uh, the religion Jainism. It's very similar to Hinduism. Um, it's just less conflict-based. There's less of a focus on the caste. Now, moving forward... We are now going to talk about Buddhism and the impact of geography, how geography contributed to the movement of peoples and ideas along the Silk Roads in the Indian Ocean trade. So here, this is Siddhartha Gautama, aka Buddha. Here is uh, an image of uh, or a map of uh, the Indian Ocean trade, as well as you can see some Silk Roads here. And then here's the Silk Road uh, going across uh, Eurasia. So with our particular element here, again, as I just said, we'll explain the development and impact of Buddhism. And with uh, that is C and D, we'll explain how geography contributed to the movement of peoples and ideas along those two uh, trade systems. Now, Buddhism really had little success in gaining adherence in South Asia. We're going to see it spread along trade routes and really become a major faith in East and Southeast Asia. So let's be real, right before we even got to Buddhism, you're like, oh, that, re that religion that's big in, in China and in Asia, right, in East Asia or Southeast Asia. Yeah, it's big there, but it didn't originate there. It originated in India with Siddhartha Gautama. So Buddhism was founded by a Hindu prince named Siddhartha Gautama, as you can see on, on the right. He's going to reject the caste system and the pantheon of Hindu gods. And he's going to instead teach that spiritual enlightenment or nirvana, as well as the escape from the cycle of reincarnation, could be reached in a single lifetime by accepting the Four Noble Truths. Now, what are the Four Noble Truths? The first no, uh, noble truth that you have is the truth of suffering. So what is the truth of suffering? Essentially, in life, universally for all people, we suffer. So we suffer for money, we suffer for prestige, um, whatever it might be. Second, the truth of the origin of suffering. So our second point here, the truth of the origin of suffering is very simple. We desire, right? We desire money, as I said. We desire fame. Now the third one, the truth of the end of suffering. So how do you end desire which leads to suffering? According to Buddha, the best way or really the only way to do that is to cease desire. So how do you cease desire? He says the truth of the path to the end of suffering is through the eightfold noble path. So think of it as like the prescription to stop desire which allows for suffering. So what are those eight things that the Buddha says you have to do in order to end desire, which leads to suffering. You have to have the right intention, right? Your right intention has to be always to achieve nirvana, right? To achieve spiritual enlightenment. Break the cycle of reincarnation. The right speech. You always have to speak within mind of enlightenment and reincarnation being broken. 
trying to achieve moksha, right? Right action. You can't be a Buddhist and go kill people, right? That's kind of against the whole belief system there. The right livelihood. You can't be a prostitute, right? You can't be selling drugs to people. You have to have the right livelihood. You have to have the right effort. You always have to maintain that I am trying to achieve enlightenment and break the cycle of moksha. The right concentration. You have to be focused. The right mindfulness, being present uh, at all moments and towards your your path to enlightenment. In the right view, always focused on breaking the cycle of reincarnation with moksha or moksha. Excuse me. Now, moving forward, let's discuss the alternative to Hindu Hinduism and its development. So, after 500 BC, Buddhism offers an alternative to the sometimes oppressive nature of Hinduism's caste system and patriarchy, right? Remember, I mentioned nothing about women in relation to the caste. Women are just seen as property within uh, ancient India, uh, and they are, especially within Hinduism, uh, they're going to be reflected at, you know, whatever their husband is. Um, you are not in any, in any means able to ever... Um, as a uh, man, uh, it is very undesirable for you to marry um, somebody that is below you. Um, and women, likewise, women, rich women aren't aren't going to marry, uh, you know, the untouchables. It's just never going to happen. Uh, and it, again, due to patriarchy here. So it's OK. It is OK for a man to marry down because the wife will be able to take on his his caste. But. Uh, generally speaking, women aren't aren't given the same uh, given the same um, luxury. Popularity of Buddhism is going to reach its peak in the Mauryan Dynasty, three twenty four to one eighty four BCE, under under Emperor Ashoka. Now Ashoka is going to make it state policy to promote the spread of Buddhism. His policies are going to ensure that Buddhism will endure as a world religion. And during the Gupta dynasty, about 600 years later, 320 CE to 550 CE, we're going to see Buddhism fall out of favor in South Asia. South Asia, again, meaning India, the Indian subcontinent. But we're going to see it endure as a major faith along the trade routes in the Indian Ocean uh, trade, as well as the Silk Road. So here's Ashoka's rock edicts. Here he has all of his major... Uh, or he has all of the major Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist teachings, uh, you know, tenets of religion here. And they're all written out in Sanskrit. And what you have here is, this is a massive boulder. Anybody could go up and read it uh, and take on uh, those Buddhist philosophies and teachings. Now, moving forward, religious diffusion. We're going to see little success really in gaining followers in South Asia, but it will spread along trade routes to Silk Roads and Indian Ocean trade. And it is going to become a major faith in East and Southeast Asia. The endurance is going to be facilitated by the tradition of monasticism in the Buddhist faith. So monks is kind of the key prefix there. Um, monks um, are going to... Uh, as well as nuns from, uh, from the religion of Buddhism, are going to establish monasteries throughout the remote areas along major trade routes. So we're going to see them set up these individual Buddhist temples where they are going to essentially take care of the temple itself and uh, try and bring converts you know, into the temple, as well as uh, you know, visiting other monasteries and trading. So our monasteries are going to spread the faith among traveling merchants, and they're going to offer a life free of the traditional confines of patriarchy for women, but also caste as well for uh, women and men. So here we have just an example of a Chinese uh, Buddhist monk here. Here you can see the Indian Ocean trade, again, throughout South uh, and Southeast Asia, um, and then into the Middle East and East Africa. We can also see here the Silk Roads over overland routes. Now, moving on, we need to discuss the Mauryan and Guptan dynasties here. And here in element A, kind of going backwards, in terms of our elements, 
Uh, here we're going to describe the development of Indian civilization, including the rise and fall of the Maurya and Guptan empires. So here is our creator of the Mauryan Empire in India. This is Chandra Gupta Maurya. This is Ashoka's grandfather. Here you can see uh, our map of the two empires. Again, remember 232 BCE is the Mauryan Empire. Uh, they're going to be in the uh, brown uh, part here, moving into uh, really kind of uh, Central Asia, but you can also see um, all the way down the Indian subcontinent, except for the very uh, southern part. And then we also have the Gupta Empire, 400 CE, so about 600 years later. They're going to be really kept only to northern India. Here's the founder of the Guptan uh, Empire. His name is uh, Chandra Space Gupta. Uh, no relation to Ashoka or Chandra Gupta Maurya. And we're going to often, uh, as historians, call the Gupta Empire the... Um, Golden Age of India. Now, the Mauryan Empire, 324 to 184 BCE, as we have here, so we don't necessarily need that. All right, so what we want to make sure we understand is that the Mauryan Empire is going to be the first empire to unify large areas of India, and you saw that on your map. There's some evidence that suggests that the founding emperor, Chandragupta Maurya, was probably inspired by Alexander the Great to unify because Alexander the Great, when he tried to conquer India, he's going to leave a political vacuum left in northwest India that Chandragupta Maurya is going to be able to fill. The empire itself is going to be ruled by a hereditary monarch, uh, again, Chandragupta Maurya, and then eventually Ashoka. It's going to be aided by a very elaborate bureaucracy. And we're going to have it made up of relatives and close associates that govern ethnic-based regional provinces. So, seems like a pretty good idea. The central government itself is going to collect high taxes. We're going to see them issue a standard currency. They're going to control mining in this period. We're also going to see the government facilitated by an extensive network of spies that are going to keep the central government aware of disloyalty. It's a pretty effective method here uh, to keep the governors under control in their, uh, you know, ethnic and um, regional uh, uh, states here. So further, we're going to see a powerful standing army that includes elephant, chariot, and cavalry divisions that will secure power. And I said states when I was talking about the different, uh, uh, different um, provinces is probably the better word. That I was looking for that made up the uh, unified Mauryan Empire. So here you can see um, Chandra Gupta, and again, here's Ashoka on top of a war elephant. Now, moving forward, Mauryan Empire is going to have agriculture as its primary economic activity. We do have an extensive network of roads and maritime connections to Southeast Asia, as well as the Middle East. And these are going to both foster internal and international trade, meaning that they're going to trade within their own boundaries very well, but also trading with places like Alexandria, which is in Egypt, Antioch, which is in modern day Syria, the Middle East, Athens, which is Greece, Bactria, which is Central Asia or Western Asia, um, and then also Southeast Asia, as you can see here with Burma. India is going to profit from export of cotton cloth, iron, and salt. They're going to get very rich in the classical or uh, ancient era. Now Ashoka. 269, Ashoka is going to come to power, and he's going to usher in a period of religious pluralism and tolerance. As a young man, Ashoka is going to engage in violent wars of conquest. When he's about 16 years old, we're going to see him uh, go to a neighboring uh, kingdom called Kalinga, and he is going to order all 100,000 people that live in that kingdom to, uh, to be ordered outside after they demand that they won't accept his rule as their new emperor. So uh, trying to make an uh, example out of them, he orders uh, his soldiers to kill all of them one by one uh, by sword, by beheading. Uh, after all 100,000 are dead, guilt 
associated with this violence, as you can imagine, as a 16-year-old, some of y'all going out and killing 100,000 people on your word, this is going to drive him to convert to Buddhism because of the you know, grief that's stricken from his guilt. So as a Buddhist emperor, we're going to see him make it state policy to promote Buddhism throughout his empire. He's going to wreck these pillars, as we saw with the rock edicts here, that are going to promote the teachings of the Buddha. Now, the policy is important because it's an important factor in ensuring the longevity of Buddhism as a major world religion. Mauryan Empire is going to fall in 184 BCE due to dynastic disputes. Essentially, uh, the successors of Ashoka are going to be um, not willing to uh, accept each other's rule. We're going to see them try and consolidate power for each other or for themselves. And we'll see it basically fracture and just fall apart. We also have invasions by outside enemies that will also lead to its undoing. But again, here's Ashoka. Here is one of his key pillars still standing in India today. And here is the rock edicts that we've talked discussed earlier. Now, Gupta Empire. So following a period of political disunity, the Gupta Empire is going to come to power, 320 CE, and it's going to rule really kind of a portion of north central India, not really as, as far in reach as we saw with uh, the, the Mauryan Empire. Our founder, Chandra Space Gupta, again, not the same guy as Ashoka's grandfather. We're going to see him model his rule, however, on that of the Maurya because of how effective it was. Now, the Gupta do do a good job of collecting high taxes, demanding labor from subjects for state projects. They're going to control metal mining and salt production fairly well. But the problem is they're never able to maintain the level of central authority that we saw the Moria have. Um, and this is predominantly due to the fact that we just don't have spies like we saw in the Mauryan Empire. You had regional hereditary governors that were kind of nominally under the control of the central government, meaning that they were under the control of the central government, but it wasn't as effective as having spies who were willing to not only depose you from your job, remove you from your job, but also to kill you, assassinate you for being disloyal or execute you for being disloyal. So we're going to see here um, the control of the central government forced the emperor to rely on diplomacy and not really scare tactics here to maintain unity of the empire. And that's, that's going to be a, a major factor why we see the Gupta fall. Now... Hinduism, economics, and intellectualism with the Gupta Empire. So this is why we really call the Gupta Empire the golden age of India. Hinduism is going to enjoy a resurgence in this period during the Gupta. And this is going to lead to the strengthening of the caste system in India and the intensification of patriarchy. So this is best seen through, uh, through the tradition of Sati. So in this uh, painting here, you have a... a a man or a husband that just recently passed away, the wife is going to throw her herself on top of the funeral pyre because she cannot live without her husband. And it's more because of the intensification of patriarchy. We see this practice happen. Um, it's predominantly because she can't live without her husband. Because again, remember women are subordinate in um, Indian society. So uh, women here would do this because they just couldn't, um, they couldn't live. I mean, they wouldn't have access to anything. Um, often, you know, the, the uh, remaining wealth that existed in the family would just go to the next oldest male within the family, you know, cousin, brother, whoever it might be, and not to the wife. So the wives would become property to some degree of, you know, the next uh, oldest male uh, and a lot of them didn't want to do that. So you can see why they would do this here. Now, internal, international trade is going to continue to flourish during this time. We're going to have major advancements in mathematics realized. So, for instance, the decimal system. Uh, Arabic numerals, which are actually wrongly identified and named, um, predominantly by Europeans that came in contact with the Arabs in the um, kind of late medieval era or really mid-medieval era. 
uh, 800s, 900s, 1000s do the Crusades. But what we'll have them do is they will name it um, the Arabic numerals, but the Arabs borrowed it from, obviously, the Indians. We also have Pi. Pi will be created during this time, um, or uh, I should say um, discovered. The Gupta Empire will fall in the 500s, and this is, again, mostly due to nomadic invaders from the Northwest, but also their administration just wasn't as, as good as the um, administration we saw under the Mauryan Empire under Ashoka. Now, looking at the images here, you have, again, a stupa. These are largely characteristic of uh, the, of the uh, Gupta dynasty or Gupta Empire. Talked about Sati here. This is a coin, a golden coin from the Gupta Empire, so highly ornate here. And then finally, what we have is just another uh, look at what we got in terms of other achievements from the period. So the concept of zero is also put forth in this period. Medicine. They're practicing plastic surgery and, and vaccines during this time. Pretty, uh, pretty incredible in the 500 CE. Architecture, we discussed how we have the stupas for Hindu worship, and they're built out of stone here. Uh, in terms of literature, we have Kaladisa, often seen as the Indian Shakespeare, um, you know, writing uh, very um, uh, human-focused stories deep in emotion. Uh, philosophers are going to put forth the idea of around Earth, which is pretty impressive. Uh, chess is created in India. Horoscopes are also created during this time period. And we have advancements in astronomy using mathematics. So we have a lot of key major uh, developments in this period. Now, next, what we're moving into is a discussion of uh, the uh, development of Chinese civilization under the Zhou, the Qin, and the Han dynasty. So here we can see the Zhou dynasty, um, really our our. Uh, second major dynasty in Chinese history, 1027 to 221, one of the longest reigns that we see for uh, China or ancient China. This is the boundary of modern day China. Here is our leader of the um, Qin dynasty. Uh, his name is uh, Qin Shi Huangdi. And then you have uh, the uh, leader of the Han dynasty that will replace the Qin. Um, and we'll discuss him in just a minute. Now, moving forward, the Zhou Dynasty. First thing you want to know about the Zhou. Uh, dates 1027 to 221 BCE. And we do see fundamental elements of Chinese government here come with the second dynasty. The first one is the Shang that we already discussed. But here we have the Zhou. This is the second major dynasty in China in China's dynastical history. So we do see principles such as the mandate of heaven, which we've already discussed, but it's very important because we see it really um, established during this period. So it's going to argue that the ruling dynasty is charged by heaven to rule the people with benevolence, often called the Tao or the Wei. And we also are going to see uh, Confucianism uh, really kind of emerge in this in, in this period. But keep in mind, Confucianism does not have a profound political impact until about 200 BCE. So it's kind of introduced in the 220s, but we don't really see it really make an impact until the Han Dynasty, which is going to follow after the Qin. Now, we do see the basic tenets of filial piety, again, uh, remaining faithful to one's family, um, venerating your ancestors, uh, patriarchy, uh, the father, the head of the household. Those are the main ideas of filial piety, not to bring shame to the family. Uh, we have adherence to tradition. Patriarchy is just discussed as well as duty. All these are established during the Zhou dynasty. Now, the Zhou are going to only be able to maintain centralized authority until about 800 BCE. And after that, we're going to see them uh, rely on a system of feudalism here to administer the empire. By 480 BCE, civil war is going to thrust China uh, into what we call the Warring States period. So in looking at these images, again, just the map of the Zhou. This shows the Zhou division of classes. 
So uh, the emperor, as he's often called in China, is really just a king. Um, but as you can see here, it shows this uh, this um, hierarchy, social hierarchy here. Uh, so you can see that the king gives land to the nobles. The nobles uh, are going to protect the peasants. The peasants are going to farm the land, and they are going to uh, serve it to the noble. The nobles will provide mil military service to the king. And this is just an image of the Warring States period uh, that will last from about 480 all the way up until uh, 221 when we see the Zhou replaced. Now with the Qin, the Qin are going to really kind of come out of the Warring States period. So the Warring States period lasts until Shi Wangdi uh, is going to emerge victorious and he establishes the Qin Dynasty. And the dates for that are 221 to 206. Now during these years of conflict, we have a new governing philosophy emerge uh, and it is going to be called legalism. So it's very easy to understand. Uh, proponents of legalism, look at the word, ism, belief, legal, law. So proponents of legalism are going to argue that humans are innately self-serving and destructive. Therefore, social order had to be maintained with strict laws and harsh punishments. So for instance, to give you the best example during this time, if a son did not listen to his father, and the father says, do this, and the son did not. In Chin China, the father could put his son to death. So it's pretty hardcore. Shi Wangdi is going to believe these ideas. So we will see him prescribe to legalism. Um, and he will build a highly centralized bureaucracy during this time around the ideas of legalism. If Donald Trump was a, pre uh, was a Chinese philosopher or a Chinese leader, he would have been Shi Wangdi. Now, the Qin Dynasty is going to be short-lived. Uh, it is going to be given credit for unifying China politically, economically, and culturally. During this time, under the Qin, weights, measures, coinage, laws, writing, and axle length are all standardized. So that is a huge accomplishment um, in the ancient era. The state is going to direct construction of extensive roads and canals. You're going to have work on the Great Wall begin. We're going to see land reform break up the power of feudal lords. Uh, and our reforms are important because they're going to lay foundations for effective administration that we see the vast empires of the dynasties that follow. So they're going to set up what will really kind of take China from the classical period into the post-classical period. So again, just image of Xi, uh, Qin Shi Huangdi. Here is the early construction of the uh, Great Wall. Crazy enough, uh, when people died on the Great Wall, they would literally bury their bodies into the wall. Um, and uh, people that visit the Great Wall say that it has a, a really weird kind of like um, uh, emotional, like, uh, response when you're there like you can feel it almost and it's almost kind of has like a supernatural kind of like ghost feel to it um, and then also here's the famous terracotta army that was um, Shi Wangdi's um, burial chamber so he had all these soldiers put up near his uh, burial tomb so that they could protect his body because a lot of people didn't like uh, Shi Wangdi at all alright now Moving forward, the Han Dynasty. The Han, 206 to 220. We're going to see the Han Dynasty here uh, continue the extens extensive use of forced labor and excessive taxation, or excuse me, said that incorrectly. The Han will be in response to the extensive use of forced labor and excessive taxation we saw under Shi Wangdi and the Qin Dynasty. So due to those uh, policies under Shi Wangdi, it's going to quickly lead to rebellion uh, with his assassination and death in 210 BCE. So out of our rebellions, you're going to have a peasant by the name of Liu Bang. He's going to emerge as the new emperor of China and establishes the Han. Now the Han dynasty is going to maintain many policies of the Qin, but it's going to temper the severity of legalism. So those harsh punishments are going to be dialed back some. 
And we're going to also see the development of the political use of Confucianism here, which is going to require leaders to earn respect of the governed. So again, the idea of the mandate of heaven here in action. If you have rebellions, you have the peasants being killed, you have uh, people being executed for harsh uh, sentencing, here you're going to see that dynasty fall. And what happens? What do we just see? Shia Wangdi is assassinated. You have rebellion. You have forced labor, extensive, excessive taxation. And as you can see, the Qin lost the mandate of heaven. The Han are obviously going to have it for about 400 years. So the combination here proves durable, long-lived. The Han are going to be able to maintain control of an empire uh, even larger than the Qin. And their capital in Chang'an, uh, we're going to see the Han here direct a vast bureaucracy. It's going to have nine ministries and regional authorities. So it's a highly complex bureaucracy here. Um, here is the assassination of uh, uh, Shi Wangdi here. You can see him about to be killed. Uh, here is Liu Bang again. And here is uh, the capital at Chang'an. This is the Imperial Palace. Now, moving forward, the Han Dynasty is going to be staffed. Our bureaucracy is going to be staffed by educated civil servants. They're going to receive appointments based on their score on a regular, rigorous civil service examination. So they have to take a test to prove their knowledge of administration. The state's going to operate an effective tax collection system. We're going to see postal service in China. We're going to see extensive roads, canals, de defensive walls. And this is going to really help protect the empire from the constant threat of nomadic invaders from the north. The security of the Han here period is going to uh, really allow for a thriving economy that's going to engage in extensive internal international trade. We're going to see really the Han China profit tremendously from the export of silk. And they're going to be doing great selling that across the Silk Road and also the Indian Ocean trade, which we'll talk about a little bit more soon. Um, economic growth here is going to be aided by advancements in farm technology. For instance, the horse collar where you could slip over the horse and they could plow the fields, as well as better irrigation systems. So we're going to see the Han go into decline around 200 CE. Major factors include... Uh, bureaucratic corruption, infighting between various uh, lords within the uh, feudal um, feudal uh, hierarchy, food shortages, epidemic disease, banditry, pressure from nomadic invaders along the northern border as stated. So here you can see civil service uh, examinations taking place. This is just showing the extent of the Silk Road. Again, Silk Road is named after Chinese silk because that's what allows for uh, these trade routes to pop up. This is an example of what that silk tapestry looks like. Um, and then here we're just showing the invention of the horse collar. Very important for not just um, uh, farming, but also for warfare as well. Now, we need to discuss Next, the development and impact of Confucianism on China. And I absolutely love Confucianism in a few ways. So here, it also is kind of terrible, though, for its patriarchy and other uh, issues. But it does stress academics, which is pretty cool. Now, what we're going to do here is just generally describe Confucius. Uh, we'll talk about why he's so important. So Confucius, 551 to 479. Um, he is going to live really kind of in the last days, the waning days, it says here, of the Zhou. Uh, and we're going to see a period of social and political upheaval. His philosophy is going to be recorded by his followers uh, in the Analects. So he doesn't actually write these. Uh, his followers are going to record it. And it proposes solutions to unrest. So he's going to argue the long-established traditions of filial piety, and the mandate of heaven are the key to social order. So for instance, he would say when he was um, 
uh, around the times of the beginnings of the Warring States period, he would say, we've lost filial piety, the focus on long established traditions, the mandate of heaven. Uh, and that's why we have social disorder. So for Confucius, the family serves as a model for society as a whole. So the eldest male of the family had a moral obligation to lead and care for his household. And he had to do that with wisdom and benevolence. In exchange, we're going to see each member uh, obliged to obey. So they had to listen to whatever the eldest male of the family ever said. So again, just an image of Confucius here. Here's an actual page from the Analects. And then finally, we have the dynastic cycle here that shows how one dynasty can lose the mandate of heaven. Again, you're going to see rebellions. You're going to see people treated unfairly. You're going to see high taxation. Um, you'll see lots of corruption. Now, moving forward from Confucianism, we want to understand that Confucius, Confucius believed the hierarchy of the family could be expanded to bring order to society as a whole. So he thought that familiar, familial relationships could also really kind of be understood through the lens of society as a whole. So he's going to argue kind of the opposite of legalism here, that humans are innately good, and if treated with respect, they would obey righteous leaders. And these ideas are going to be further hashed out in the Analects. The Analects are going to lay out five relationships that are rooted in long-held Chinese tradition, and they're believed to bring peace and order to society. So what are these five relationships? Each relationship is going to be based in reciprocity. So reciprocity of respect and duty. So exchange, give and take here. So they include ruler and subject, father and son, husband and wife, older brother, younger brother, and friend and friend. So in an ideal Confucius society, wise superiors protect and respect their subordinates. Subordinates obey and respect their superiors. And it's essentially the golden rule. Never do to others what you would not like them to do to you. So again, it's very important to understand that wise superiors protect and respect their subordinates here. Confucianism is going to create a fairly rigid social hierarchy here. It's going to strongly support patriarchy and say, really, women have no place in society other than doing as their oldest male family member tells them to do. Uh, we're going to see the encouragement of education. Uh, we're going to see it support the tradition of ancestor veneration that we've seen uh, in early China uh, Chinese history, like we saw with the uh, with the Shang or the Shia. And here we're going to see it uh, really kind of uh, here become uh, a part of Chinese history from the Han Dynasty onward all the way up really until uh, Mao Zedong in the 1930s, 40s. And even then you still have elements of Confucianism existing in China. Um, so here, just again, same image, it shows that relationship, those five relationships. And then here we're just showing our new um Social hierarchy here with Confucianism clearly intact. Uh, kings and emperors at the top. Scholar gentry class follows. So scholars, your academics, your bureaucrats. Poor peasants and farmers are now above skilled workers and craftsmen. Why is that? Confucianism stressed the importance of farmers being the hardest workers in society. So they deserve to be higher than skilled workers and craftsmen, merchants and women. So specifically merchants because merchants don't do anything. They just sell stuff. They make money off people's hard work. All right, moving forward. Let's talk about the Silk Road and the Indian Ocean trade. So here you can see an image of a camel along the Silk Road in the steppes region of China, or excuse me, of uh, uh, Central to East Asia here, or really kind of Eurasia. It's a massive steppe, uh, or it's a massive dry grassland area that exists across um, uh, Eurasia here, you can see it really kind of this dry brown area uh, with some mountains near it. And then finally, we can see in blue, these are the um, these are the Indian Ocean trade, and then we have in red the Silk Roads. Now, moving forward, you can see here, as I just spoke about with the Silk Roads, it's the vast open steppe land of Central Asia that is home to numerous nomadic societies. 
So our societies here are going to rely on a pastoral economy. Pastoralism is the practice of uh, caring for livestock. And we're going to see them exploit the natural resources of the open steppe region. So because we see the reliance on livestock here, this is going to make societies experts on the use of pack animals like camels, horses, oxen. All right. Um, and important to understand is that transport technologies here are going to be combined with the potential for vast profits from this uh, trade in silk. Uh, from China, glassware from Europe, cotton cloth from India, horses, spices, perfumes, and slaves uh, from various regions here. This is going to lead to the rise of the Silk Road. Silk Road is going to have two principal phases. First one that we're talking about is 100 BC to about 800 CE. And this is going to link the Roman Empire in the west, the Chinese dynasties of the Han, Sui, and Tang in the east, and the Indian empires of the Mauryan and Gupta in the south, and the Persians that are, well, kind of in the middle, Middle East, or east of the Middle East, kind of there in, in Western Asia. The Silk Road will again peak again from 1200 to 1500 CE, and that we'll see that in Unit 2 when we're discussing uh, the Mongols, as well as the um, Dar al-Islam, or the emergence of Muslims in the region. So we've already discussed all of these images here. Here is, again, just the silk that we saw from China. And then the camel along the steppe region. And then, again, our two trade systems, the Silk Road, again, in red. Now, the Silk Roads are going to be important. The first phase of the Silk Road, it's primarily a relay system. So each merchant only travels a portion of the full length of the road. So it's going to be pretty slow. Major trading, trading cities are going to develop, develop um, as a result of this system. So, for instance, like Chang'an, Samarkand in Western Asia, and Bukhara. So you can see some of these uh, uh, cities here. So Samarkand and Bukhara across the Silk Road. And individuals are going to rarely travel the full length of the trade routes, but culture and technology absolutely is going to travel. So, for instance, Buddhism. As we already talked about, spreads from India to China. Christianity is going to spread to the east. Stir up the horse where you stick your feet in and you can ride and be stable. This is going to spread from Central Asia to Europe. China in the Middle East. You have horse technology spread to China. We've got new crops introduced to China. Alfalfa, grapes. Rome's going to get new, uh, new crops and peaches and apricots. And the Middle East is going to get rice, sugar cane, and cotton. A lot of those things are very, very uh, characteristic of, of all those societies. Think about especially the Middle East with rice. That is a huge staple crop. Um, imagine the Middle East never having access to rice. Um, so again, just showing our extent of all the major cities there uh, across um, the Silk Road. Final points here about the Indian Ocean trade. So the Indian Ocean trade... Um, is going to really get its start in the Indian Ocean. Um, we're going to talk in South Asia, East Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. Um, so the predictable nature of the monsoon winds of the Indian Ocean. Uh, monsoon winds are 100 mile per hour winds. They normally carry like six months of rain with them. Super strong. Um, so these winds off the coast of the Indian Ocean are going to ease open water navigation and allow for the rise of a vast network of exchange between East Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and China in the classical age or ancient era. So we're gonna see mariners here motivated by potential profits. They're gonna really kind of focus on the exchange of goods here. Uh, we're not gonna ask you to know them, but ebony, ivory, copper, myrrh, frankincense, dates, spices, jewels, cotton cloth, silk. Those are really the main things here. Uh, we're going to see technologies developed here that capitalize on the monsoon winds uh, and allow for the efficient transport of massive amounts of all these goods that we just listed. So the technologies you actually want to know are the Dao, the Arab Dao, and the Latin sail, again, developed by Arab sailors. You also have the Chinese Yunk, which is going to be important. What that does is a massive ship, as you can see right here. Um, it can carry uh, loads of stuff here. 
So due to the seasonal nature of the monsoon winds forcing long stays by sailors uh, based, you know, wherever they might be trading, uh, we're going to see the establishment of diasporic communities in a lot of the major ports that we have in the Indian Ocean maritime system. So for instance, like Malacca, um, you know, various other big cities like uh, uh, Mogadishu, uh, Mombasa, uh, a lot of these, Mumbai, we're going to see a lot of these um, uh, cities pop up because of this Indian Ocean trade. And you're going to have a lot of uh, guys that are just going to simply, a lot of merchants that are going to live in uh, these foreign lands because it doesn't make sense for them to go out and fight uh, time when they could get on a ship with those monsoon winds that can you know push them to go almost 100 miles per hour. If they did it without the winds, they'd be going 20 miles per hour. So there's no sense. So they end up staying in a lot of these uh, ports of call here. So we have diasporic communities here leaving an enduring impact on the host culture. So, for example, Swahili language of East Africa is a great example here. Uh, it's a blending of Arabic with indigenous Bantu languages. You also have the Malay Peninsula that has a Chinese community that's still there today. And again, just showing the Indian Ocean network here, connecting East Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, and East Asia. Uh, and again, the Arab Dal down here and the Chinese Yonk right here. That's it. That's all we got for today on Standard 2. We'll see you back in Standard 3.